Did you know that there have only been 11 princesses of Wales since England took control of the country all the way back in 1284? It seems like a really low number, right? Well, stay tuned to this week's video from History Calling to hear who they were and are, why there have been so few princesses of Wales over the past 750 years, which three never made it from princess to queen, and which two became princess of Wales through their first marriages, but queens through their seconds. There will also be lots of fun factoids, like what the longest gap between princesses was, which royal house had no princess of Wales at all, who the youngest and oldest women were to gain the title, and the identity of the woman who was engaged to one prospective Prince of Wales, but ended up marrying another. The title Princess of Wales was in use before the union of England and Wales in 1284, though the women in question were also sometimes referred to by slightly different titles, such as the Lady of Wales. Since the medieval union between the two countries, though, it has been used to refer to the wife of the heir to the English, later British throne, who is known as the Prince of Wales. I already have videos on some of the women I'll be talking about today, some are full biographies, others look at just one aspect of the princess's life or death, but rather than constantly reference them throughout this video, I'm just going to leave them linked below for you. I've also put together a Princess of Wales playlist for you to gather them all up. Rather than full life histories, what you're essentially getting today will be short taster biographies of each woman, as I obviously don't have time to talk you through their entire lives. The first person to hold the title in this manner was Joan of Kent. Born in around 1328 during the reign of Edward III, her father, Edmund Earl of Kent, was the king's half-uncle, making Joan his cousin. Edmund was executed for treason when Joan was two, and she ended up spending much of her childhood in the household of the queen, Philippa of Hainaut. At the age of just 12, she contracted a secret marriage to a member of the royal court, Sir Thomas Holland, then aged about 25. But when he left to go campaigning in Prussia, her family forced her into a second marriage in 1341 to the soon-to-be Earl of Salisbury. Thomas complained about the matter when he returned to England, but was overruled. It was only in 1347, when he had become a wealthy man, that he was able to take his case to the papal courts where, after a couple of years of wrangling, during which time Joan was effectively held prisoner by her second husband, his marriage to her was found valid and she returned to him in 1349, having apparently been living in bigamy and adultery for the previous seven years. The Hollands had five children together, and after Joan's mother and her surviving brother and sister died in 1349 and 1352 respectively, Joan became Countess of Kent and Baroness Wake in her own right. Thomas Holland died too in December 1360, leaving his famously beautiful wife, posthumously referred to as the Fair Maid of Kent, as a widow. She didn't stay unmarried for long, however. Her cousin the King had a son called Edward, Prince of Wales, known to history as the Black Prince, and in the spring of 1361, the pair surprised everyone by marrying. This was Joan's second clandestine wedding, and it required a retroactive papal dispensation to make it legal, given the pair's blood relationship. Joan, however, was now the Princess of Wales, and indeed the Princess of Aquitaine, at least for a time, after her father-in-law made her husband its prince. She and Edward had two sons, though one died as a child, but Joan is the first of our three women who never made the jump from princess to queen. Her husband predeceased his father, dying in 1376, and so Joan was the Dowager Princess of Wales when her remaining royal son, the ten-year-old Richard, inherited the throne as Richard II in 1377. She guided him during the early years of his reign and even managed to survive the infamous Peasants' Revolt of 1381, despite being in the Tower of London when it was stormed by rebels that summer. In her final years, she put on an enormous amount of weight and could hardly stand, but she continued to play a role in public affairs, trying to heal breaches between the King and his uncle, John Duke of Lancaster, and between Richard and his half-brother, John Holland. She died in August 1385 at the age of about 57, and at her own request was buried with her first husband, Thomas Holland. Princess number two was Anne Neville. 
Anne was the daughter of Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, known as the Kingmaker, and lived through one of the most tumultuous times in English history, the Wars of the Roses. She was born in 1456, and during her early life there were two contenders for the throne, Henry VI and Edward IV. Although her father was Edward's cousin, his constantly shifting loyalties meant that it was to Henry's son, Edward Prince of Wales, that Anne was married in December 1470, at the age of just 14. This makes her the youngest Princess of Wales we've ever had, and surely the youngest we ever will have, given that it's no longer legal to get married below the age of 16 in the United Kingdom. Her father and husband died at the Battles of Barnet and Tewkesbury just a few months after the wedding, and having been taken in, seemingly imprisoned actually, by her brother-in-law, George Duke of Clarence, who was a brother of King Edward and the husband of her sister Isabel, Anne was married again to the king's other brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, in around 1472. Presumably, the new duchess thought any chance of her becoming queen was now past, as King Edward had two sons, and George and his children were in line after them. Fate intervened, though, and brought this former Princess of Wales to the throne after all. George was executed for treason in 1478, his children were barred from inheriting the throne, and after Edward died in 1483, Anne's husband effectively deposed their nephew, the 12-year-old Edward V, and took the throne for himself, as Richard III, with Anne as his consort. The couple had one child, a son called Edward of Middleham, born between 1473 and 1476, and created Prince of Wales after his father's accession, but he died in 1484. Anne followed him to the grave in 1485, aged only 28, and having been queen for less than 21 months. She was buried at Westminster Abbey, and her husband died later that year at the Battle of Bosworth, and was replaced on the throne by Henry Tudor, who now became Henry VII. After Anne, the next woman to hold the title was Henry's daughter-in-law, Catherine of Aragon, and her tenure was also unusual in many ways. The daughter of King Ferdinand of Aragon and Queen Isabella of Castile, when she married King Henry's eldest son by Elizabeth of York, Prince Arthur Tudor, in 1501, the 15 year old Spanish princess surely expected to become Queen of England someday, and indeed she did. But just like Anne Neville, it wasn't through her first marriage. Instead, Arthur died a few months after the wedding at Ludlow Castle, and Catherine eventually went on to marry his younger brother, Henry, in June 1509. This Henry was already king, however, so she was never his princess. Flash forward 24 years, and after a tragic childbearing career, which included a son who lived only seven weeks in 1511, and just one child who survived infancy, Princess Mary, born in 1516, Henry VIII had had enough of Catherine and dumped her in favour of his mistress, Anne Boleyn. In order to do this, however, he claimed that Catherine had never been his true wife because of her prior marriage to Arthur. She was therefore demoted back to the title of Dowager Princess of Wales, and to date is the only woman to ever hold it twice. She herself never recognised this change in status, though, and continued to style herself the Queen of England, until her death in January 1536. It's therefore up to you whether you want to see her time as princess as having finished in 1509 or 1536. Either way, there was now a long gap between princesses of Wales, the longest in the title's history, in fact. This was due to a combination of factors. Henry VIII's only surviving son, Edward VI, never married, and was followed to the throne by his two childless sisters, Mary I and Elizabeth I. In 1603, when Elizabeth died and the throne went to James VI of Scotland, there was at long last a Prince of Wales again called Henry. However, he died unmarried at the age of 18, and by the time his little brother, Charles, got hitched to the French princess, Henrietta Maria, he was already king, and so she went straight to queenship without ever passing through the Princess of Wales title. Their eldest son, another Charles, spent a huge chunk of his youth in exile in France after the abolition of the monarchy, and he too ultimately didn't marry until after he became king, wedding Catherine of Braganza in 1662. 
There is a story that he married his mistress, Lucy Walter, whilst on mainland Europe, but this is unproven and highly unlikely. Charles and Catherine had no children, and so upon his death in 1685, the throne went to his brother, who became James II. He did ultimately produce a Prince of Wales with his second wife, Mary of Modena, but when James was ousted from the throne in 1688 in favour of his childless daughter Mary, born to his first wife, and his son-in-law slash nephew, William of Orange, he, his wife, and their baby boy had to go into exile. This little boy was not married yet by the time of his father's death in 1701, so he didn't create a Jacobite Princess of Wales, nor did his eldest son, known as Bonnie Prince Charlie, marry during his time as Jacobite Prince of Wales. Back in England, with both Mary and William dead by 1702, the throne went to Mary's sister, Queen Anne, none of whose children were alive by that point. The Stuart family is therefore the only royal dynasty so far to not produce any princesses of Wales. It was only in 1714, with Anne's death and the passing of the throne to her distant cousin, George, Elector of Hanover, now George I of Great Britain and Ireland, that the title was finally revived after a gap of at least 178 years, and arguably as much as 205 years if we date Catherine of Aragon's tenure as having ended in 1509. The woman to break this princess drought was the new king's daughter-in-law, Caroline. Princess Wilhelmina Charlotte Caroline of Brandenburg Ansbach, often known more simply as Caroline of Ansbach, was born on the 1st of March 1683, the daughter of John Frederick, Margrave of Brandenburg Ansbach, and his second wife, Princess Eleanor of Saxe Eisenach. Her father died in 1686, and her mother ten years later. Caroline was thereafter raised by various family members and in 1703 was considered as a wife for Charles, the future Holy Roman Emperor. Upon researching Catholicism, however, which religion she would have had to convert to in order to be a suitable wife, she found that she could not make the change and instead wished to remain Protestant. She was therefore still available for marriage in 1705, when she was wed to George Augustus, son of the Elector of Hanover, and then third in line for the throne of England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland, which didn't become Great Britain and Ireland until 1707. As I explained a minute ago, in 1714, Queen Anne Stuart died, and Caroline's father-in-law became George I. She and her husband became the Prince and Princess of Wales, and the family moved to England, though her eldest son, Frederick, born in 1707, had to stay behind in Hanover to represent the dynasty there. She was particularly prominent as princess because the king had no acknowledged wife, having divorced and locked up her mother-in-law, Sophia Dorothea of Sell, back in the 1690s after she'd had a scandalous affair. His long-term mistress, the Duchess of Kendal, may have been his morganatic wife, but she was certainly never recognised as queen, leaving Caroline as the highest-ranking lady in the land. The princess and her husband were also more outgoing than George I, allowing themselves to be seen in public more often and hosting events like drawing rooms at their homes. Caroline's education had been quite poor, but she read widely, patronised the arts, supported the emerging practice of smallpox vaccinations, and did try to learn English, beginning even before she became Princess of Wales, though the language never came very easily to her. She gave birth to eight children, but her family life was made very difficult by the exceptionally poor relationship between the Waleses and the king, which culminated in the king kicking his son out of the royal court at St James's in 1717 after the prince got into a dispute with the Duke of Newcastle at the baptism of he and the princess's latest child. Caroline went with her husband, though it meant losing custody of her children, something made all the more unbearable when the very baby who had just been christened died the following year. She was allowed visits with her offspring, but even when relations between the king and the prince were patched up in 1720, the children were not returned to her. In 1727, her husband ascended to the throne, making her the Queen of Great Britain and Ireland and the Electress of Hanover. Caroline was an influential consort with a particular interest in religious affairs, and her husband, though never faithful to her, loved her and trusted her judgment. 
She championed the premiership of politician Robert Walpole and was widely acknowledged as the power behind the throne, both by those in the political world and the public at large. One rhyme doing the rounds during her queenship ran, You may strut, dapper George, but we'll all be in vain. We know tis Queen Caroline, not you, that reign. This was rather unfair to George, who was actually a very hard-working king, but it shows the unusual degree of influence Caroline had, as did his decision to leave her as regent of Britain and Ireland four times during his reign, with full powers over domestic affairs whilst he visited Hanover. When she died a long and horrible death in November 1737, due to long-standing complications following the birth of her final surviving child back in 1724, he was desolate. By the time of Caroline's demise, the post, if we can call it that, of Princess of Wales had been filled once more by her daughter-in-law, Augusta of saxe gotha Altenburg, who had married Caroline's eldest and much detested son, Prince Frederick. Augusta had been born on the 19th of November 1719, and was the daughter of Friedrich II, Duke of saxe gotha and his Duchess Magdalena. Though not from a great royal house, she impressed George II when he met her in 1735, and he decided she would do very nicely as a wife for his heir. The 16-year-old princess, who spoke not a word of English, came to England in April 1736, where she was almost immediately married to Frederick, becoming the new Princess of Wales. The two got along very well, largely because Augusta promised from the outset to be totally subservient to her husband, and was thus very unlike his mother, Caroline. She quickly learned the language and for many years was well thought of in her adopted country. Inevitably, she was pulled into the deteriorating relationship between her husband and his parents, but she managed to maintain pretty good relations with her parents-in-law, and George II was even known to ask her to intercede with Frederick on his behalf on occasion. The couple had nine children in total, including the future George III, but in March 1751, Augusta suffered one of the greatest losses of her life, when her husband died. At the age of just 31, she was a widow, and like Joan of Kent before her, had lost her chance of ever becoming queen. She immediately threw herself on her father-in-law's mercy, and he agreed to give her a generous stipend to live on, allowed her to keep custody of her sons, and guaranteed that she would be regent, albeit with considerable limits on her powers, if Prince George came to the throne as a minor. In contrast to how she was portrayed in the TV show Queen Charlotte, a Bridgerton story, which is loosely based on the life of her daughter-in-law, Charlotte of Mecklenburg-Strelitz, Augusta was not a political powerhouse, managing her son's existence after he came of age. In fact, once he had turned 18 in 1756, she largely withdrew from public life and lived primarily at her homes at Carlton House and Kew. The worries about a minority didn't matter in the end, as George II lived until 1760, and George III therefore succeeded at the age of 22. Augusta was now the mother of the king, though not the queen mother, as she had never been a queen herself, but her reputation was badly damaged by rumours, most likely untrue, that she had had an affair with the Earl of Butte, who was her son's tutor and later groom of the stool, and much of her old popularity ebbed away as a result. She died of throat cancer in 1772 and was buried in Westminster Abbey. As George III had already become king by the time of his marriage to Charlotte, she was never Princess of Wales, and it was only when their eldest son, another George, married his first cousin, Caroline of brunswick wolfenbüttel that the title was resurrected once again. Now, I know a lot of people today think that the now King Charles III and his first wife, Lady Diana Spencer, who we'll be coming to later in the video, had the worst royal marriage between a prince and princess of Wales. But that's only because they don't know the story of George and Caroline. This pair's union was such a disaster that it had irretrievably broken down before it was even 24 hours old. Caroline was born in 1768, the daughter of Carl II, Duke of brunswick wolfenbüttel and George III's sister, Princess Augusta, not to be confused with their mother, who I was just telling you about. In 1795, when she was just shy of her 27th birthday, she was married off to the future George IV, in a union which makes the six-month marriage of Henry VIII and Anne of Cleves look like a resounding success. 
Her husband had already contracted an illegal marriage with another woman, Maria Fitzherbert, in 1785. He also foolishly took no interest in the choice of his new bride. He was only marrying because his father wouldn't give him any more money if he didn't wed and produce an heir. And he and his new princess took an instant dislike to each other when they met. The prince wanted the sort of submissive character that his grandmother Augusta had been to Prince Frederick. And that wasn't Caroline, who understandably objected to his mistress, Lady Jersey, but was also quite petulant and difficult herself. The groom was drunk at the marriage ceremony, and while they both told different stories of their married life, they did agree that it had been a disaster. He maintained he'd only ever slept with her three times, having been too disgusted by her lack of personal hygiene to do any more. She hinted that he was barely able to consummate the union. It was something of a miracle, therefore, that this remarkably short conjugal relationship was enough to produce their one child, Princess Charlotte, born on the 7th of January, 1796. The Waleses officially separated that same year, and Caroline was allowed to see her child by the king, even though the Prince of Wales objected to it. The Princess of Wales now lived her own life, entertaining widely and reportedly having numerous affairs. There were rumours, too, that she had had illegitimate children, eventually leading to an investigation into her conduct in 1806, which declared such rumours to be false, but criticised her behaviour nonetheless. When her father-in-law succumbed to serious mental illness in the 1810s and her estranged husband became the Prince Regent, Caroline had a more difficult time seeing their daughter. But Charlotte had a very problematic relationship with the prince too, and even fled to her mother's house on one occasion to try to circumvent his order that she should live at Carlton House. The young princess was persuaded to obey her father in the end though, at which point her mother left England to go travelling around mainland Europe. In her absence, Charlotte tragically died in childbirth, as did the baby, in 1817, rendering the Waleses' entire marriage and all the misery it had caused ultimately pointless. Her mother's activities and behaviour on the continent were monitored by the Prince Regent spies, who reported back that she led a most dissolute life. He hoped to divorce her before he ascended to the throne, but never managed to do so, and so when his father finally died in 1820 and he became King George IV, Caroline was his queen. She now returned to England to claim her new position, with her arrival sparking a wave of protests both for and against her. A parliamentary bill was prepared to divorce her from the King on the grounds of her behaviour, and its passage through Parliament was known as the Trial of Queen Caroline. It caused a sensation, both on the streets of London and in the media, especially as she attended Westminster each day to listen to its progress. Many of the witnesses against her were shown to have been bribed or blackmailed, and it didn't help that the king was widely known to be an adulterer. In the end, the bill was dropped on the 10th of November, but when Caroline tried to attend her husband's coronation on the 20th of July 1821, she was refused entry into Westminster Abbey. Finally accepting defeat, she was all set to take the government's offer of £50,000 a year to basically go away and not come back, only to die of an intestinal obstruction on the 7th of August, just two and a half weeks after the coronation debacle. She was buried in Brunswick at her own request. Caroline had ceased to be Princess of Wales in 1820 with her husband's accession to the throne, and there followed another longish gap before the title was used again. George IV had no other legitimate children after Charlotte died. His brother and successor, William IV, had no surviving legitimate offspring either. And in 1837, the throne went to their niece, Princess Victoria. She married her cousin, Prince Albert, in 1840. And in 1841, she produced a new Prince of Wales, called Bertie in the family, but known to history as Edward VII. It was only when he was old enough to be married that a new princess was created. His wife was Alexandra of Denmark, who had been born on the 1st of December, 1844. A famous beauty, she was the daughter of Prince Christian of Schleswig-Holstein-Sonderburg-Glücksburg, later King Christian IX of Denmark, which is a lot easier to say, and his wife, Princess Louise of Hesse-Kassel. She married Bertie at St George's Chapel, Windsor, on the 10th of March, 1863, at the age of just 18. The couple were young, good-looking, and sociable. 
They entertained widely and spent lavishly, including on the now famous royal residence of Sandringham in Norfolk. They had six children, including Prince Albert Victor, known as Eddie, who was heir to the throne, and Prince George, who would ultimately end up inheriting it. More on those two in a minute. Alexandra's third pregnancy with her daughter Louise in 1867 coincided with a bout of rheumatic fever and ended up permanently damaging her health, giving her a lifelong limp and increasing the problems she was already having with deafness. This caused her to largely withdraw from a public social life and put a distance between her and her already unfaithful husband. Unlike her mother-in-law, who disliked babies in particular, she was a highly affectionate parent, and she was heartbroken when her eldest son Eddie died of pneumonia in 1892, leaving his brother George as the new heir. Alexandra finally became queen on the 22nd of January 1901 upon the death of Victoria, but it was to be a short stay at the top, for Edward VII died too in 1910. During her time as queen, she partook in much charitable work and maintained a cordial, though not close, relationship with her philandering husband. She became queen mother upon his death and the accession of her second son, George V, and continued with her charity work as long as her health would allow. By the time of her death in 1925, though, she had completely lost her hearing and much of her sight. She died at Sandringham and is buried at Windsor. The eighth Princess of Wales was Alexandra's daughter-in-law, Mary of Teck. Born Victoria Mary Augusta Louise Olga Pauline Claudine Agnes, but known as May within the family, she entered the world in London in 1867. Her parents were Francis Duke of Teck and his wife Princess Mary of England, first cousin to Queen Victoria. Little Mary spent much of her childhood in England, though the family also travelled in Europe, notably in Florence, and in late 1891, she was engaged to be married to the second in line to the British throne, Princess Alexandra's eldest son, Prince Albert Victor, Duke of Clarence. In time, she could expect to become the Princess of Wales and then the Queen. This is indeed what happened, but not with Albert, or Eddie as you'll recall he was usually known. Instead, as we've seen, he died in January 1892, seemingly shattering the princess's hopes, but not for long. His brother George was swiftly created Duke of York, and in May 1893, Mary found herself engaged to him instead, with the wedding taking place in St James's Palace on the 6th of July. The couple weren't verbally or demonstrably affectionate, but their letters do show that they loved each other. They had six children together, including the future kings Edward VIII and George VI. Her time was spent in domestic and foreign tours, state events and charitable work, then, in January 1901, Queen Victoria died, and on the 9th of November, George and Mary were created the new Prince and Princess of Wales, a title which the monarch's eldest son doesn't automatically inherit, by the way, it has to be given to him. This change greatly increased her prominence within the family and the country at large, leading to more foreign trips, among other things. Her time as princess was relatively short, for her father-in-law, Edward VII, died in 1910, at which point she became the Queen. Mary was not known as a sparkling conversationalist, and was called shy by those who were her friends, and dull by those who were not. She was certainly very formal and reserved, and not given to displays of emotion. She was a hard worker, though, and deeply patriotic. As Queen, she continued with her visits and charity work, and when World War I arrived, she greatly stepped these up, and in particular encouraged women's contributions to the war effort. During this time, she also witnessed one of the royal family's most famous rebranding exercises, when, in 1917, the family name was changed from the Germanic saxe coburg gotha to the very English-sounding Windsor, in homage to one of their most famous homes, Windsor Castle. After the war, she was presented with the famous Queen Mary's dollhouse, now on show at that castle, as a thank you from the nation for all her efforts. In 1919, she lost her 13-year-old son, Prince John, who had suffered from epilepsy and possibly learning disabilities. It's notoriously hard to diagnose things like that at such a remove. He had been living quietly at Sandringham with his nanny for the final three years of his life, after his seizures became very severe. The Queen repeatedly expressed great sadness at the loss in her letters, but also relief that her child was no longer suffering. 
She continued on with her charity work and social engagements, working hard to maintain the popularity of the royals in an era which had seen the collapse of both the German and Russian royal dynasties. In 1936, her husband passed away and her eldest son became King Edward VIII. By the end of the year, though, and much to her horror, he had abdicated the throne in order to marry the American divorcee Wallace Simpson, leaving the crown in the hands of her second son, Bertie, now known as George VI. As Dowager Queen, Mary lived at Marlborough House and carried on with her philanthropic endeavours, working steadily in this capacity throughout World War II. Another of her children, Prince George, Duke of Kent, not to be confused with his big brother who became George VI, was tragically lost in a plane crash in 1942, and in 1952 King George VI died as well, placing Mary in the unusual position of being one of two Queen Dowagers, alongside her daughter-in-law, the former Lady Elizabeth Bowes Lyon. She therefore saw her granddaughter, Elizabeth II, ascend to the throne, but died barely a year later in March 1953. She was buried next to her husband in St George's Chapel, Windsor. Mary of Teck had ceased to be Princess of Wales back in 1910, and as her eldest son did not marry whilst he was prince, and the throne then went to George VI, who only had daughters, then to Queen Elizabeth, it wasn't until her oldest son, the then Prince Charles, got married that the ninth woman to become princess took the title. I'm speaking, of course, about Lady Diana Spencer, perhaps the most famous woman to ever hold this title. Diana was born in 1961, the daughter of the future Earl Spencer and his wife, Frances Roche. She was raised at the family seat, Althorpe, and also at her mother's London home after her parents divorced in 1969. In 1977, she met the Prince of Wales for the first time, who was then dating her sister, and in 1980, she began a relationship with him herself. In February 1981, they got engaged, and in July, shortly after her 20th birthday, they married at St Paul's Cathedral in London, instantly making her the new Princess of Wales and informally known as Princess Diana. By that point, she was already the most famous woman in the world, and she would continue to be so for the rest of her life. She had two sons, Prince William, born in 1982, and Prince Harry, born in 1984, and together with her husband, undertook countless royal engagements and tours, including to the United States, as you see here. She was also widely known for her extensive charity work, which included bringing awareness to some high-profile but unpopular issues such as AIDS. Her personality, which was famously warm and relaxed, placed her in stark contrast to some of the other members of the family, and she was also revered as a fashion icon. Her marriage, however, did not fare so well. Prince Charles's ongoing relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles caused great tension. The press intrusion was overwhelming and Diana suffered with an eating disorder and bouts of very serious depression. By the late 80s, she was having affairs too and it was increasingly clear that the marriage could not survive. The couple announced their separation in 1992 and after both gave high-profile television interviews discussing the breakdown of their union, a divorce was finalised in 1996. Diana lost her HRH title, short for Her Royal Highness, but remained Diana, Princess of Wales, and was granted a generous financial settlement and allowed to continue living in Kensington Palace. The ending of her marriage also made her the third and final woman on today's list to be Princess of Wales, but never Queen. She reduced the number of charities she patronised to just six, as she was no longer a member of the royal family, but continued to bring great attention to issues such as landmines. She was still hounded by the press, however, and no longer had the benefit of royal security. In August 1997, whilst in Paris with her boyfriend, Dori al Fayed, the pair were killed in a car crash along with their driver after being chased into a tunnel by paparazzi. The princess was just 36 years old. Her death shocked the world and brought the popularity of the royal family, especially Queen Elizabeth and Prince Charles, to a new low, as they were blamed for not taking better care of her. She was given a grand funeral, though it wasn't officially a state funeral, interestingly enough, in London a week later, before being buried on the Spencer family estate at Althorpe, where she had grown up.
The next woman who held the title Princess of Wales is going to be somewhat controversial for some of you, I'm sure, as she didn't actually use the title while she had it, and I imagine some people aren't going to want to believe that it was hers, both for that reason and due to her continuing unpopularity in some quarters. I'm speaking about Camilla Parker Bowles, born Camilla Shand in 1947. Camilla met the then Prince of Wales in 1971 and seems to have had a relationship with him until 1973. The reason I'm not giving you solid details though is because to the best of my knowledge they haven't spoken publicly about this period of time and I found a few different accounts of exactly when they were an item and when they weren't. I suspect no one really knows except them and of course they aren't obliged to tell the world about their past if they don't want to which is fair enough. The best I can say is that they seem to have had an on-again, off-again relationship during the 1970s, but Camilla wasn't viewed as suitable royal wife material at the time, and instead wed Andrew Parker Bowles in 1973, going on to have a son and a daughter with him. Charles, as we've seen, married Diana in 1981, but he and Camilla had remained good friends at the very least, and their romantic relationship had resumed by 1986. It became public knowledge in 1993 after a private phone conversation between the pair was published in the press and Camilla was vilified for her role in the breakdown of the Wales's marriage. She was divorced from her first husband in 1994. Before we continue, if you're enjoying this content, please remember to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel with notifications switched on so you never miss an upload. I sometimes have people tell me that they think they have all notifications switched on, then realise they don't when they don't get an alert about a video, so it might not hurt to just double check your notification status, both for my channel and for others you follow too. You can also find me over on Instagram, where I post at least once a week, as well as on Patreon, where I provide bonus material including many podcasts and early access to ad-free videos. Thank you to everyone who already supports me on that platform, as well as those of you who make one-off donations to the channel using the thanks button underneath videos. Your kindness and generosity are, as always, very much appreciated. Camilla now embarked on a gradually more public relationship with Prince Charles as they and their PR team worked to rehabilitate her image. They made their first public appearance together in 1999 and she met the Queen in 2000. In February 2005, they announced their engagement and on the 9th of April, they were married in a civil ceremony here at Windsor Guildhall. Now we come to the bit which I suspect is going to generate some complaints in the comments. During the first 17 years of her second marriage, Camilla opted to be known as the Duchess of Cornwall as the Duke of Cornwall was one of her husband's other titles. This was in deference to the fact that her predecessor, Diana, was so closely associated with the Princess of Wales title, and it was felt prudent not to have the two women known by the same name. However, just because she didn't use the title Princess of Wales doesn't mean she didn't have it. Diana didn't use the title Duchess of Cornwall during her marriage, but she was, nevertheless, the Duchess of Cornwall. In fact, she and Camilla were both also the Duchess of Rothsey in the Scottish peerage, as well as Countess of Chester and Baroness of Renfrew. You don't have to use a title in order to have it. So although we never usually think of Camilla as having been the princess, she was, and that is why she's on this list. At 57 years old, when she married Charles, she is also the oldest woman to have ever become Princess of Wales. During her time as Duchess of Cornwall, we'll just use that title because that's what she used, Camilla followed what is now the usual pattern of royal work, using her platform as a senior member of the royal family to support numerous charities, as well as accompanying her husband on foreign trips and state occasions. To give you an idea of what that workload entails, the Guardian newspaper reported in 2023 that she completed 3,886 engagements between 2005 and 2022, an average of 216 per year. In September 2022, Queen Elizabeth II died and Charles became King Charles III. Camilla was initially known as the Queen Consort, presumably to avoid confusion with Elizabeth, before being gradually transitioned to simply Queen Camilla, which is the more usual way for the King's wife to be addressed. Just think of Queen Mary and Queen Alexandra, for instance. Again, I've seen people under previous videos where she's been mentioned basically stomping their feet like children and saying she's not a queen because they don't like her, but she is, and complaining at me won't change that, and quite frankly, it just looks juvenile and deluded. 
Camilla was crowned alongside her husband in May 2023 and as Queen is continuing her charity work and other royal engagements. The title of Princess of Wales, however, has now passed on to the 11th and final woman on my list today. Catherine Middleton, commonly referred to as Kate, was born in January 1982 in Reading, England, and spent most of her childhood in her home country, though she also lived in Jordan for two years. In 2001, she took up a place at St Andrews University in Scotland to study art history, where she met her future husband, Prince William. The pair dated until 2007, then had a brief breakup before getting back together. They announced their engagement at the end of 2010 and were married at Westminster Abbey in 2011. William was created Duke of Cambridge just before the wedding, and so Catherine took the title Duchess of Cambridge. The couple have three children, Prince George, Princess Charlotte and Prince Louis, and Catherine's charity work has focused heavily on supporting children during the early years of their lives and mental health awareness. As with all senior royals, she has also undertaken numerous foreign tours of the Commonwealth and other countries, and completed 1,169 official engagements between 2011 and 2022, a number which would have been even higher if not for her maternity leaves and the sick leaves she was forced to take during the early stages of her pregnancies due to suffering an extreme form of morning sickness. When her father-in-law became king in September 2022, Catherine was very briefly known as the Duchess of Cornwall and Cambridge before Charles made her and William the Prince and Princess of Wales a day later. She is not properly called Princess Catherine, just as her late mother-in-law wasn't technically Princess Diana because she wasn't a princess of the blood. However, she is sometimes referred to as such. Catherine is highly popular in the UK and around the world, and for now at least, the title of Princess of Wales is in good hands. I hope you've enjoyed this whirlwind tour through 750 years of English and British history. Let me know in the comments below which of these princesses is your favourite and why, and until next time, keep learning.